This is lecture six in this course on antibiotics, and the topic is antibiotics for anaerobic infections. The single learning objective is to know the spectrum of activity and major side effects for antibiotics active against anaerobic organisms. Aside from their brief mention in lecture one on the classification of bacteria, I have not discussed anaerobic bacteria in too much detail. For the most part, Anaerobic infections can be divided into two general categories, infections of the oral cavity, deep spaces of the neck and the lungs, including the pleural space, and intra-abdominal infections. Bacteria causing the first category include actinomyces, peptostreptococcus, bacteroides oralis, fusobacterium, and prebotella. Although technically not anaerobic, the microaerophilic streptococci share many similar microbiologic and clinical characteristics as peptostreptococcus and is frequently included on this list. Anaerobic bacteria causing intra-abdominal infections include various species of bacteroides, cloistridium, peptostreptococcus, and fusobacterium. With the exception of the genus Clostridium, which is responsible for a range of disease states from C. diff colitis to tetanus to gas gangrene, the other bacteria here are probably unfamiliar to you. The reason is simple. Specific anaerobic bacteria are infrequently identified in routine culture, and when they are, antibiotic sensitivity testing is unreliable. In other words, even when a good fluid or tissue sample is obtained in a patient with a clinically overt infection, the culture fails to grow the responsible anaerobic bacteria and we are forced to treat empirically based on speculation that anaerobes are contributing to the process. As a consequence, knowledge of the individual species of anaerobic bacteria are not nearly as important as with aerobic bacteria. Related to this, there is a relatively short list of conditions in which anaerobes should generally be covered even in the absence of growth and culture and even in the presence of a known other organism as these infections are frequently polymicrobial. Periodontal infections, various infections of the deep spaces of the neck, aspiration pneumonia, lung abscess, empyema, intra-abdominal abscess, and secondary peritonitis. So what are the options for antibiotics in these infections? There are essentially just six. As with lectures four and five, uh, as well as the upcoming Lecture 7, this chart will review the mechanism, spectrum of activity, notable adverse reactions excluding allergies, and some other info for each category of antibiotic. I've chosen Bacteroides, Actinomyces, um, non difficile Clostridium, and the closely related Peptostreptococcus and Microaerophilic Strep as four representatives of anaerobic bacteria. The first and one of the most common options is metronidazole, more commonly known at least in the US by its trade name Flagyl. Metronidazole acts by creating free radicals within the cell. It is highly active against Bacteroides and Clostridium, in both of which resistance is exceptionally rare, but is not active against Actinomyces and the Peptostreptococcus microaerophilic strep group. Some notable adverse reactions are a metallic taste and something called a disulfiram effect. For those of you not familiar with that, the disulfiram effect occurs when a drug blocks the actions of the human enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, which is essential for the metabolism of ethanol. As a consequence, patients on metronidazole who consume alcohol can develop high levels of a metabolic intermediary called acetaldehyde, which causes skin flushing, tachycardia, headache, nausea, and vomiting, sometimes within minutes. Metronidazole has excellent bioavailability. Unfortunately, it has absolutely no coverage of any aerobic bacteria and therefore should generally not be used as monotherapy for anything other than C. diff colitis, uh, which will be discussed further in a minute. The next category of antibiotic is the carbapenems. These inhibit cell wall synthesis and are active against just about all anaerobes. A notable adverse reaction is a lowering of the seizure threshold. As a general rule, imipenem and miropenem are preferred over ertapenem due to slightly broader coverage, 
though the latter has the significant advantage of decreased dosing frequency. Combinations of a beta-lactam and beta-lactamase inhibitor, as with unison and zosin, also inhibit cell wall synthesis and are also active against just about all anaerobes. They are associated with a relatively large number of minor side effects, but some notable ones are thrombocytopenia and acute interstitial nephritis, which can rarely cause kidney failure. Clindamycin inhibits the 50S ribosomal subunit. It generally covers everything, with the exception that Bacteroides fragilis, present in large numbers in the gut, is often resistant to it. Clindamycin is frequently cited as the most common cause of C. diff colitis, and although it's conveniently available in both IV and PO forms, the Q6 hour dosing frequency may limit compliance with outpatient therapy. Although in lecture 3 on the classification of antibiotics, I discussed the second generation cephalosporins as being good for anaerobes. Uh, however, they are actually not used too much for that anymore, as their coverage of bacteroides is variable, and there isn't a lot of data about their coverage of anaerobes of the upper airways. Finally, moxifloxacin, which inhibits DNA synthesis and is the only major quinolone recommended for anaerobic infections, has decent coverage of actinomyces and the peptostreptococcus group, but variable coverage of others. Moxi, as with all quinolones, causes QT prolongation, may exacerbate myasthenia gravis, and can cause tendinopathy and tendon rupture, the last of which is most common in the elderly and in those on steroids. Systemic quinolones are generally not recommended for children, as immature animal models demonstrate they can cause arthropathy. There are just a few more anaerobic antibiotic pearls of which you should be aware. Ampicillin and penicillin G are both active against actinomyces and peptostreptococcus. Vancomycin is active against gram-positive anaerobes, but not gram-negative ones. Doxycycline, which is not traditionally thought of as an anti-anaerobic antibiotic at all, actually has activity against actinomyces and non-difficile clostridium. And chloramphenicol, an antibiotic rarely used in the United States, but very common in other parts of the world, has excellent activity against all anaerobes except for C. diff. So how does one choose an antibiotic in a suspected anaerobic infection? The basic principle is actually fairly simple. If, looking at our patient, we suspect an anaerobic infection above the diaphragm, clindamycin is preferred as metronidazole misses actinomyces and microaerophilic streptococci. If we suspect an infection below the diaphragm, metronidazole is preferred because clinda misses some B. fragilis. If we need an antibiotic that covers both above and below, we would preferentially choose either a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, or a carbapenem. Moxifloxacin is generally considered a second-line agent, perhaps for patients with severe beta-lactam allergies. Remember that metronidazole should never be used as monotherapy except for C. diff, and should instead be combined with something that provides excellent gram-negative coverage, which is frequently ciprofloxacin. You may wonder then if there's any advantage of placing a patient with suspected intra-abdominal infection on metronidazole plus Cipro versus placing them on Zosin or a Carbapenem. To be honest, I find this decision to be usually arbitrary, often driven more by concerns for side effects or availability of antibiotic than it is driven by nuances of microbiologic coverage. One exception to this is that the relatively recent rise in quinolone resistance among E. coli in the United States may make a broad-spectrum beta-lactam a preferred option in some circumstances. I'll end the lecture talking about Clostridium difficile. C. diff, as it's more commonly known, is the major cause of infectious colitis triggered by antibiotic use. It's carried in the colonic flora of up to 50% of hospitalized adults. As C. diff itself is resistant to most antibiotics, Use of antibiotics alters the remainder of colonic flora and permits C. diff itself to multiply and release diarrhea-producing toxins. There are essentially just two common antibiotics active against C. diff. Metronidazole in either PO or IV form and vancomycin, which for C. diff is used in PO form only as it has negligible absorption in the GI tract 
and thus few if any side effects. As VANC is only active against gram-positive organisms, it only minimally impacts repopulation of the gut flora during recovery from the colitis, as most gut flora are gram-negatives. Although oral VANC is thought to be slightly more effective than oral metronidazole, its use is limited by its astonishingly high cost of anywhere between $1,000 and $2,000 US dollars for a typical two-week course. The newly developed macrolide, Fidaximin, may become a third option. It was approved for this use in the US in 2011, shows excellent activity against C. diff, and like vancomycin, is minimally absorbed and has minimal impact on normal bowel flora. That's it for this lecture on antibiotics against anaerobic infections. The next lecture will discuss antibiotics against infections by atypical bacteria.